So we have Dr. Marinelli and Dr. Nelson both on right now. There's no way again that I can introduce themselves better than they can other than to tell you they are incredible, incredible admissions experts. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Marinelli and Dr. Nelson take it away and I'll see you all in an hour. So <laughs> welcome everyone. It's nice to kind of be a part of this uh, really huge experience. Uh, it's an honor to be talking here today. Well, extracurricular activities uh, is such a big topic. We kind of break them into uh, what we call the big five, and uh, they're they're delineated on this slide here. Um, volunteer work, community service is always kind of uh, letter A and me. I know it's uh, in the middle there. Uh, leadership is number two. Uh, These are, are no, and not in any particular order. Exactly. Uh, lead, uh, research is number three, then shadowing, and then the fifth is clinical experience. So we're gonna uh, kind of dive into each one of those just uh, for a little bit. Um, starting with uh, volunteer work community service, uh, how I look at this is, this is one of the few areas of the application that you can kind of interject a bit of your narrative or your passion. So I encourage students to do volunteer work in areas that are meaningful to them for whatever reason, so that they can kind of discuss on their application why they did that particular uh, community service instead of just kind of going and you know uh, punching a clock at a food bank or whatever just to get hours so there's a quantitative aspect to it as far as you need a certain amount of hours in order to have shown that you have a commitment to this uh, community service volunteer work but also a qualitative aspect to it and the fact that do something that's meaningful to you give back to a community that's less fortunate with something that you uh, you're passionate about the second thing is leadership, and this is probably the most misunderstood extracurricular, in my opinion. A lot of times students will come to me and say, I have great leadership. I have, uh, I am the vice president of the physics club and the treasurer of the pre-med interest group. And I'll say, well, what'd you do in those positions? Well, not much. We didn't meet very often. I say, <laughs> that's a title, right? That's not leadership. <laughs> leadership does not require a title, nor does title equal leadership. So uh, I, I've seen admissions committees that I've been on really um, give a lot of weight to initiatives of leadership that doesn't have that kind of delineated title or role. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say those roles aren't good. They are good, especially if you are, uh, you know, obtaining some responsibility in those roles. But it's also kind of a, a nice addition to set yourself apart a bit to take on leadership where it wasn't really expected of you. So taking on independent research projects. Um, st starting your own volunteer initiative, uh, you know, tutoring, mentoring our leadership positions. So anything really where you take on more responsibility than was expected of you would be considered leadership. And it's more so how you translate that leadership then onto your application and the written materials than it is the actual title of your leadership role. Research that's, is the next one. That's such a great point. I'm sorry to interrupt you, oh, but please. that is just such a great point because um, you're so right. Like if somebody just has that title and then they're either trying to talk about it in their writing or in an interview, they're going to find themselves totally stuck because like you said, it wasn't actually significant. They didn't actually do anything. To, they just held a title and yep. that's going to be meaningless and actually reflect pretty poorly, especially if you were asked, hey, what'd you do as a vice president of the physics club? <laughs> oh, right. you know, we met. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would just yep. it would just be crickets. And so that would be something that could be actually detrimental. And so there is this nice balance, too, of trying to find those activities, but making sure they're meaningful and they're going to contribute to you and your application. Yeah, there's only so many minutes in the day. And with, you know, a lot of that taken up by academia, you have to be very selective in what you mm -hmm. choose. Research is the next. Um, we recommend students do at least a year of research. And uh, a longitudinal research experience is uh, a better experience uh, than kind of these short burst experiences. So, you know, there's all, uh, it's really attractive to apply to some of these kind of six weeks, eight weeks, summer uh, re research internships. Yeah, that's better than nothing. But if you can find something a little bit more longitudinal at the institution you're in school at, that, that in my opinion, is a, a better opportunity. Uh, maybe you can then do a presentation or even get a publication with your name on it. Shadowing is the next one. And in this case, um, shadowing, we uh, recommend at least shadowing three different specialties. 
uh, for at least a day or two, just to kind of get to know what you're, what you're getting yourself into. And then clinical experience, which the difference between that and shadowing, shadowing you're a fly on the wall, clinical experience, you're interfacing with patients. So um, if you have the lead time, and granted I'm a bit biased because my career was in the ER, uh, being an EMT is a fantastic uh, clinical experience. You're, you're interfacing with patients uh, that are uh, you know, not easy to interface with, and uh, that's getting that clinical acumen to be able to connect with them, communicate with them, um, you know, intervene with whatever their needs are. Uh, you know, I give this analogy when I'm working with pre-med coach students is, okay, if you have two options, one is to, uh, you know, be an EMT and the other one is uh, to scribe at a dermatology clinic. And your goal is to show the admissions committees that you can connect with patients that aren't always easy to connect with, which one of those two is going to do the better job of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there are ways to find clinical experience where you're working with patients and other healthcare staff without that extra training as an EMT or like a medical assistant. But I find it more, more and more difficult for applicants. Whereas when I was applying, I, I felt like I found that pretty easily. I was able to secure like this hospital volunteer where they, they provided a bit more training. We worked alongside nurses and stuff. Uh, I, I think those positions are probably becoming more and more hard to come from, come by, excuse me, um, just from talking to different applicants. Seems like a lot of people struggle with that. And so having a little bit extra training like an EMT or an MA can really help get your foot in the door and have a position that is going to be much more significant than just, you know, maybe doing a volunteer at a hospital where you're delivering water to patients. You're going to actually be involved in patient care. Yep. Um, and I think the training, if I'm not mistaken, it's pretty limited, like, I mean, well, not limited, but it's pretty light. I think it's only a few months of training to get certified as an MA or an EMT. So yep. doing that over the summer or partially online, you know, is a, definitely a great option. Exactly. Another couple of good options that I've helped students find recently that have been very fruitful. One is volunteering for hospice. Mm -hmm. and have just profound clinical experiences come from that. And it's very easy to onboard with that. Plus, you're doing a great service for these patients. Mm -hmm. Another one is working as a phlebotomist. Most mm -hmm. uh, hospitals will even, you, you, they don't, there is an opportunity to get certified as a phlebotomist, but it's not required by most states. So mm -hmm. a lot of hospitals will train you kind of on the job to do that. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. And I put these little bullets at the top too of this slide and Dr. Nelson um, touched on them, you know, but I think the best activities too are the ones that, like you said, are longitudinal that shows you've had a commitment over time, um, not only in research, but all of these things. Like I think those long-term activities, instead of hopping around from one to another and gaining, you know, 15 hours here, 30 hours here but really dedicating yourself to an organization and to an activity, those ones are going to be more profound on your application. And those that naturally transition to a leadership role, like too, like I've seen so many students that, you know, be start as a volunteer in the hospital and then become a volunteer coordinator. You know, they move up in that position that really shows growth and maturity initiative, all of those things. Um, an original idea you know, as you mentioned, like maybe they start their own independent research project. I've seen students start like a um, a nonprofit. I mean, those are so cool. It's just such a great way for them to show just how much, you know, motivation and drive they have, how they are willing to take the extra step to achieve something that they're interested in and help people. Awesome. And then the other thing too, I think sprinkling some international work in there too, it could be really great. Uh, med school coach partners with global medical brigades and they offer different brigade trips abroad. And I think maybe that's not your main focus. I think it's important for students to have experience both internationally and domestically in the healthcare system. But I think having some international work can really, really give students some great perspective, um, cultural competence, all kinds of really nice ways to grow and mature by spending some time internationally in different cultures and maybe a bit out of your comfort zone. 
Yeah, the, and these extracurriculars are, are not mutually exclusive. So one thing can kind of count for, for two different categories. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I had a student that I worked with in pre-med coach and at her institution, they did not have a global medical brigades organization representation. So she actually initiated that kind of uh, set up a construct at her institution, which is a great leadership initiative for her. And also she went on a, a global medical brigades uh, uh international experience yeah that is so awesome yeah what a way to kind of take that initiative create an opportunity not only for herself but then subsequent students too i love yeah. that yeah another example of doing that of kind of taking initiative and, and sharing it with other students i have a student that i worked with that um he was really interested in working with patients that have aphasia uh, that can't speak after having some sort of stroke or a uh, brain injury. And uh, he created this, uh, uh, I think the acronym is DATA, D-A-T-A. -A. I can't remember exactly what it stands for now, but um, they were bringing art therapy to patients with aphasia in order to give them an opportunity to communicate. Since they can't speak, they were communicating through their artwork. Oh, wow. That is really neat. That is so cool. He's, and what uh, a thing to kind of, be able to discuss during an interview. I mean, I could imagine if I was interviewing that student, I was already thinking about how many questions I'd want to ask him and follow up and just exactly. you know, turn the interview on that and be like, wow, what are some of the things you've seen? Like, how did you see people improve? I mean, there's so much there. Right. And what a great stepping stone for some future career. I mean, he could go on to be a neurologist or an ER doctor. It doesn't really matter, but he's really taking that extra step Yep. to help patients. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And the really cool thing is he, he reached out to me later and said, you know, I'd really like to share this with other institutions. So I connected them with a couple other students at different uh, universities and wow. helping them set that up at their institution. Very cool. Very neat. A lot of stuff you can do out there too. And I think, you know, as you said, these are kind of like the five pillars. These are the things that we really look for and admissions committees are really looking for, but you can spend your own uniqueness on this. It doesn't just have to be this bread and butter research or, you know, following around a doctor in the hospital, like do, do something that you're interested in and you're passionate about. And that's really going to make a difference too on your application. So um, thanks you guys so much for joining us this morning. This was a lot of fun. Dr. Nelson, it's always a pleasure. So I appreciate you know, your company. My pleasure too. So thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Marinelli. You guys are awesome admissions experts and really have helped so many students along the way. This was an awesome presentation.